did his PhD and his postdoc at MIT, and he's a co-founder of a, a, a great initiative for electrophysiologists that is called Open EFIS, that I guess he will present, but on a broader perspective. And I specifically want to tell that uh, Jacobs is a perfect example of a, a PhD student who decided to devote a lot of his time for the community, and somehow he survives still in the system. It's not easy, and I'm sure we'll discuss that. But uh, yeah, thank you, Jacob, for this talk. All right. So. Um, I want to start by giving uh, a little bit of an overview of uh, OpenEFIS, which is an organization that uh, deals with uh, open source hardware. Then I want to talk a little bit about uh, open source hardware in a more general sense, because some of the things that we heard today about open source approaches to science in general and software are a little bit different, I think, for um, open source hardware, uh, where people still think about it in slightly more old school terms. And then in the end, I want to give you a bit of a preview of stuff that's going to come out uh, later this year from OpenEFIS. So uh, OpenEFIS is a nonprofit organization uh, that organizes the development and distribution of open source tools. And the important thing is that we're organizing the development and we're not necessarily developing ourselves. So I, for instance, I'm currently not developing any tools for OpenEFIS. We're dealing with uh, some of the organizational things, but currently I do like zero work developing hardware myself. And instead, we're organizing development. That means that there's other people that uh, spend time developing tools, usually for their own use because they need tools to do new types of experiments. And then we encourage and help them to build the tools in a way that other people can use them. Uh, so that's an important distinction. Uh, distribution, we're also going to talk about. Um, the focus of OpenEFIS, as the name suggests, is extracellular electrophysiology, particularly during behavior. So these are mice where we record from the brain while they do something interesting. Um, I started uh, OpenEFIS in roughly 2010 together with Josh Siegel because uh, we wanted to do novel experiments. But now, as I said, uh, OpenEFIS is really in the hand of a lot of other contributors. Um, when we started, there was mostly a problem that we wanted to do electrophysiology with a system that was cheap and hackable, uh, particularly because we wanted to do experiments where we record from the brain and then manipulate the brain at the same time, which was hard to do at the time. Uh, with existing systems. Um, and um, just to give you an idea of how we were uh, able to roll this out, in the beginning it was literally uh, Josh uh, and myself um, basically group ordering something like 10 pieces of hardware at a time and thanks to a bunch of donations from uh, three or four different labs, we were then able to give it to three or four labs to begin with and then we convinced them to, to use it, to trust the system, and uh, we helped them very intensively in the beginning so that when someone else asked them how these tools worked, they could say they work. And we didn't just start by giving it to everyone and then they would break in laps of people that weren't super capable. So we had kind of a slow rollout, but since 2010, um, we now have, I don't even know how many different labs, it's probably in the hundreds now in uh, something like 20 or 30 different countries. But the important thing is that these are not just users that buy the tools. A lot of these uh, uh, universities have labs where people are developing tools. And that's the important distinction when I talk about open source hardware. It's not just tools that are nice and cheap. <coughs> They're also tools that, because we developed them not to make money, but because we had a need as scientists, like we're all scientists first, and then we develop tools to serve our science. They're automatically at the bleeding edge of what is needed for our science. So they're typically years ahead of what you can buy commercially, because we start with the question, and then we develop the tool for the question. Um, uh, and and the, the fact that they're open source also means that now someone else can take the tool and change it for their question, so that keeps the tools fresh. And uh, we have a pretty, uh, I think, impressive number of people that dedicate time, aside from their research, to put back into the pool of open source hardware through open EFIS tools, through other tools. But specifically for us, as I'm going to show you some examples, uh, we're now mostly uh, driven by people that come to us with new ideas where they modified a tool uh, and then we can take the tool and give it to other people again. So uh, I want to talk about the dissemination aspect a little bit. This is a process you're all familiar with. Uh, a researcher gets funding and then generates scientific ideas 
So this could be a scientific um, insight, this could be a design or a process, and then on the way there you get a bunch of nasty implementation details. So what kind of glue did you use to secure the implant to the animal, what's the exact protocol that you used uh, for the surgery, we already talked a lot about the software. And what then happens is that the science gets published and the uh, tools end up in the trash as soon as the person leaves the lab because these are the nitty gritty details that everyone forgets about. And uh, what we want to do is we want to take these nitty gritty details through like GitHub we've already talked about, reintegrating them into the stream. And the important thing is that it's not as easy as taking your things and putting them online. If you do that, you might as well put them in the trash as well because they're usually not documented and supported enough and someone else can't just look at your design files and build something new. It's a continuous effort that requires documentation. Licensing is also an issue, of course, because uh, sometimes you can't just take something that you have in your lab and put it online for free. You've got to think about uh, whether there might be IP in there. Distribution is not obvious at all. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And then training and support, of course. If I build a new tool and I just give it to someone else, they have no idea how to use it, right? But I don't necessarily have the time to go around training everyone. So these are all challenges that we have that are similar to software, but specifically the um, distribution uh, it's a little bit trickier than with software because we're talking about actual hardware products here. Um, so uh, I already said the small details matter and it's really important for, for scientists to unlearn uh, what they know about their method a little bit to share it. So when you do a certain project in your lab and you develop a protocol, like you build something, this could be any, that doesn't really matter. You, you build something, it's pretty obvious to you how to do it. Um, and I have not seen a single method section that someone built, that someone wrote that actually allows someone else with no prior knowledge to replicate the experiment because there's always details missing. So um, this is part of what we're trying to do is encourage people to not just write a method section but make the tools shareable by putting extra effort into it. And another important thing is that we often hear people say that learning someone else's tool and the same thing goes for code um, takes a lot of time and effort. So why would I spend four weeks learning someone else's tool if I could build it myself for three weeks and then I have my own tool? And the answer to that that is really underestimated, I think, is that if you spend four weeks learning someone else's tool and then modify it, you have something that at least two pairs of eyes have looked at, so it's fairly bug-free. If you spend three weeks, you probably have something that's buggy because only one person has built it. So that's another important aspect here is that by reusing things, you get more pairs of eyes on the same piece of code, you make better libraries, you make better tools, so that in itself makes the science better. Um, let me give you a quick overview of some of the tools that uh, we currently have in the pipeline. So for those of you that don't do extracellular electrophysiology, it's relatively simple. You have an animal with an electrode, you amplify the signal, then you digitize it. Uh, it goes into a computer, if you need software on the computer, of course, that computer spits out data files and then you get a scientific publication in the end. Um, and when we started, this is what the systems looked like, and they were expensive uh, because they had a bunch of expensive components in them. And then around uh, 2010, Intan Technologies, Reed Harrison developed uh, a little chip that has the entire electrophysiology system with amplification, digitization, and a digital interface all in one chip. And you can get an entire system for under 500 bucks. It's just a little chip. So really all that we had to do back then was to make a little system that has the chip here, that's the part that goes on the mouse, and then this is really just a glorified cable that puts the data into the computer. Um, and then we needed to make a software for that. And um, so the software was mostly the uh, project of Josh, who's now at the Allen, and Aaron Urvas Lopez, who has joined us uh, almost right at the beginning. And what they did, and this again goes to the spirit of open source and modularity and writing libraries rather than scripts, uh, is that our software is built out of modules that are individually compiled and exchangeable. And what that means is that if you have a specific scientific question for which there exists no software, all you have to do is you have to rewrite one of those modules and all the rest of the stuff you can take as it is and they're nicely modular. Um, so you can switch out the way you do data acquisition. If you don't like the bandpass filter, you can put your own bandpass filter in there. If you need a new visualization for a new type of probe, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So that's um, uh, an important aspect of uh, the system. And there's a decent number of different plugins, uh, as these are called, that do different functions already in existence for OpenEFIS. And again, each of those is typically born out of the need for an experiment that is currently not possible. And by reducing the workload of writing an entire software suite to the workload of making just a little plugin, we're making science go faster. 
Um, one of these is uh, visualization and data input for the NeuroPixels probes, uh, which you just saw. Um, and so Josh uh, at the Alm Institute, together with uh, uh, Michael Fox and, and a few other helpers, has developed uh, software for visualizing NeuroPixels data. And in fact, OpenEFA software is currently being used at the Alm Institute for all NeuroPixels recordings. <laughs> as one of those examples. And uh, Josh is looking for two software developers right now to work on this. So if you know anyone, uh, get in touch, um, because it's an interesting and uh, hard challenge to make sense of all the data that comes out of these things. So another thing that we have, so uh, John Newman developed this really nice LED drivers. Uh, this is an LED driver that kind of can turn a light on and off within a microsecond, which is important for certain types of experiment. Didn't exist before, so now you can buy it. Um, this is my current project. It's a drive implant. If you come to the workshop tomorrow, you can see that. That's basically just a way of putting electrodes into the brain uh, that's uh, fast, robust, and easy to build. Um, Arne Meyer uh, in London has taken uh, a drive design like that and stuck a camera on the side, which is another nice thing that you can do with open interfaces, right? So we tell them ex we, all, the, all the documentation is online so you can add to it more easily. So here, a simple camera on this, uh, on this mouse's head while the mouse is running around, all, all of a sudden you have access to pupil position, diameter, you can track whiskers with this camera. Uh, so th th this team was able to, for the, not exactly the first time, but pretty much for the first time, observe what visual cortex does in an animal that's actually running around. Is it just visual or does it code for position of the head and eye position and stuff like that? Uh, again, something that wasn't possible until someone stuck a tiny camera on there. Um, so why did we do this thing as open source instead of making a, a company or, or a startup or something like that? And um, there's sort of two aspects to this. So the first one is that as a organization, uh, as I already said, promoting the development of tools is different from developing tools. If we had made this into a startup, we would have uh, been incentivized to build a brand where we say, Open EFIS or any other startup, this goes for, for everyone who does something like that, uh, is developing all these cool tools and then we employ people and or we take stuff from the internet or something and we sell it and we say, we did this, this is cool, right? We're trying to do exactly the opposite. We want to say other people did the tools, they should get credit for the tools and we're making it easier to distribute the tools. And this is something that is typically not in line with what a company that needs to turn a profit would do. Um, so this does two things. A, we talked a lot about that it's very important for tool developers, uh, be it software or hardware, to get credit uh, because it's hard enough to, to get properly credited in academia by enabling other people to do the science. Right? It's hard work where people spend their entire career doing this kind of stuff. And they need to go on having a career, right? Um, so. It's very important for us to step into the background and say, these people did the work and we're just distributing it. It also means that we get fresh tools, right? So everyone gets better tools by doing something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so th these are reasons why OpenEFIS itself is an organization that is not a startup or a company that runs a for-profit. Um, however, I don't think there's an intrinsic problem with having open source commercial uh, tools. So there's a lot of opportunity to make money with open source and make better science happen because now you have, once you have money and you have uh, companies involved, you can do a lot of things that you can't just do with grant funding and individual apps. So for once, selling and supporting open source tools can be profitable, right? What good is it if there's tools online for, uh, if there's uh, plans online for a tool and you have to go around and spend a month buying all the different parts and putting it together? Right? You're scientists, you're not engineers. Why shouldn't there be a company that takes all the plans, assembles things, and then sells it? They're definitely going to be more efficient than you are going to be because they know how to solder, they know how to do the quality control, all that stuff. So if we want to make science go faster, we should be interested in companies that take tools that are open source, that have been developed in labs, that are maybe a little bit half-baked, and we should have a company that profitably takes these plans and sells them while giving credit to the people that developed it. But I don't think it's a good idea for everyone to have a 3D printer and trying to reinvent the wheel all the time. It might be fun, but it's not efficient science. And I think it can be profitable for the companies as well, as it should be. Everyone needs to have a salary at the end of the day, right? Um, 
We also think that tools don't need to be fully open. Right? Uh, so Reed Harrison's uh, chips are a good example. These chips are not open source. We use them, they work very well because we know exactly how they work. Right? So if you have open interfaces and you can use part of it, I don't see a contradiction in having some intellectual property tied up in a tool as long as it is uh, well documented. Um, and yeah, so standardized interfaces can help removing redundant efforts. And this is one example of a standardized interface. So we actually worked with Intan uh, on coming up with a little connector and a standard that is shared by all open EFIS tools. We're going to talk about uh, shared connections in a little bit also um, with regard to the miniscope and Daniel's going to talk about this. But having standardized interfaces is again something that a company that wants to make a profit has no interest in. In fact, almost all electrophysiology systems I'm aware of use proprietary connectors because they want to sell their probes. And uh, open source companies can sell things that work with other companies, right? So again, everyone win-win. Uh, the final point that I want to make is that it can be uh, that doesn't exist a, a lot yet, but it, I think it can be profitable to also just help people with the technical problems, right? If you're stuck on a technical problem for a month, uh, you're basically wasting, depending on how you count it, between like uh, five and ten thousand dollars, right? Just a month of no progress in a, in a lab. Uh, so spending five or ten thousand dollars in any other industry, you would say obviously you fly in a consultant and solve the problem if that exists, and we don't do that yet in neuroscience. I think that's another uh, wasted opportunity. So uh, here's a couple of companies that sell open science tools. But to reiterate the points I just made, uh, I think there's two major gaps in the current commercial landscape for uh, open source tools. So for one, it's hard to get tools. You need to make group orders, collect parts, and it, it takes a long time. And then when you have an open source tools, uh, it's not like with a commercial one where you have a guarantee that for a year or something, you can call someone and yell at them if it breaks, right? Uh, and uh, after two or three years or something, who knows, right? Uh, you're on your own. But they're often superior, uh, cheaper maybe, but definitely superior than commercial tools. So a lot of scientists need open source. So this means there could be an opportunity to sell open source tools. You're not going to make a lot of money because you don't have an intellectual property uh, monopoly. So anyone can download uh, the parts and uh, compete with you. So you can't ask for a ton of money, but it also doesn't cost much to make them. Uh, you can provide cutting edge technology, so you can typically outrun commercial companies because you get the freshest stuff from the researchers. Um, and uh, the support replacement, so if something breaks, you can charge people separately, right? So that's one of the things people underestimate with open source tools. They say there's no guarantee, but you don't need to guarantee if the thing costs a thousand bucks, right? If you, instead of spending 10,000 bucks on a commercial system, you get a thousand bucks, you get some open source thing that breaks after a year or something, cool, you now have support for 10 years, right? Just buy 10 of them. Um, except that now you don't have to call someone, you just swap it out from the one you have on the shelf. Uh, so that's, that's another important uh, point, that if you make things cheap enough, you actually don't need as much support for robustness reasons. The other thing is that there's currently, as I said, almost no commercial uh, offers for getting technical help. If I'm stuck with my two-photon microscope and it's something I built myself, I need to hope that I have friends that I can call. I can't just spend money on it. I think that's also holding us back a little bit. Um, it requires some change in the funding landscape because it's currently not normal to put money on grants uh, to uh, hire consultants. But I think there's a large potential for overall productivity gains because I think we can all easily find uh, cases where someone in lab was stuck for weeks, if not months, on a technical problem that some expert in the field, like some electrical engineering person or an optics person or an expert in the surgery that you're using when you don't know someone that can show you the surgery or something, right? Like just having someone fly in and showing you the step that makes your surgery go, right? Sometimes it can be that simple. So I think there's a potential for, for productivity gains. Um, I want to use the last couple minutes to give you a preview of the technology uh, that we're going to release in the next year. So. This is roughly what an experiment in systems neuroscience looks like. You have a mouse, uh, you have an implant with electrodes you record from, but then you also might want to have electrical stimulation maybe to do something in the brain or an LED to do optogenetics. You want to have a camera to track what the animal is currently doing. So a lot of experiments look roughly like that. And you need one, two, three, four different boxes. They all need to be synchronized. And then you have a ton of cables going to the mouse and it can barely walk, right? Um, so this is a project that Jonathan Newman and Jack Zhang in uh, Matt Wilson's lab at MIT have been working on. And basically what they did is they said, uh, screw this, we're going to take all this hardware and just put it on the mouse head and uh, make it small enough that the mouse doesn't notice. And now we only need one cable 
And uh, we're also going to get rid of the camera and instead do full 3D tracking of the mouse. So this is what this looks like. Um, it's a head stage that's two centimeters diameter, so it fits nicely on a mouse. And it has on it um, basically all the things I just described. So it has 64 channels of electrophysiology, electrical current stimulator, accelerometer, 3D tracking, and an optogenetic uh, LED driver. So this is fitting with the drive I just uh, told you about. So all in all, it makes a nice small package. Uh, this is what the real system looks like. Uh, it's a tether that only has two, co uh, two conductors, so we can put it through a commutator very easily and it's incredibly thin. And you don't have to uh, make complicated thick cable assemblies anymore. And keep in mind, this, if you want to do optogenetics, again, that's the only thing you need, right? There's no more optical fibers or anything like that. Um, there's a bunch of cool stuff happening here where we take multiple data sources, squeeze them all through that cable, and then it comes out the other end. Um, this is what the hardware looks like. And then in the end, you just plug the thing into the computer and then the software automatically has the 3D tracking and the LED and whatnot. And the fact that we can take multiple data sources and squeeze them through a cable with a common interface like USB or something like that means that, for instance, you can also put like a mini scope here or really anything. Um, but uh, Dan is going to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, we're working on having the mini scope and the um, open EFA system actually use the same exact interface. So you can have an acquisition system where one day you plug in a mini scope and the next day you plug in an open uh, traditional head stage or a camera or something. So again, standardized interfaces and then companies could sell different parts for that, uh, whatever, but it makes your life easier because you only need one input board. Uh, the stuff I just showed you is all entirely on GitHub already. So if you go to this address, you can look at all the printed circuit boards uh, and uh, some of the software, I think part of the firmware is missing, but you can have a look at this. Uh, and the last part is that the system is incredibly fast. So if you're interested in controlling the brain based on what the brain does, if you're interested in reacting to neural data, which is not done a whole lot, but increasingly, then you care about how fast this is. And this system is so fast that you can go to the computer and then you can write your control algorithm in C, Julia, whatever, whatever you want, because you're now on a regular PC and you can send a signal back to the mouse in under 100 microseconds. So this is actual data from this which means that now you have a system in which you can potentially sort spikes and react to individual spikes before they are over, way before the spike is over, without having to use a complicated DSP or something like that, just written, uh, just C code and uh, libraries that we're going to provide. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank all the contributors. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter to get a sense for when that hardware is going to be available. Yeah, thanks.